This isn't it. Uh, I'm going to put it on this week after I figure out how I got to route the cable to reach the back. But anyway, it's uh, supposed to be a 1080 full HD, whatever. Probably just show how scruffy <laughs> things really are. I may have to go back to the uh, <laughs> less resolution. All right, several things, always and ever. First thing, see... I don't know if it's it's ever a good thing to pull a curmudgeon's leg. And so because there are there is no nuance in the typed word, I don't know if people are trying to pull my leg or what. So it's not nice to pull a curmudgeon's leg. Speaking of mounts other than horses, my favorite mount is the boule. They are especially useful when riding the war against dwarven cavalry because boules eat dwarven ponies for breakfast. Literally. Yeah, I know. I created it. The reason why it especially likes dwarven ponies is because in the fan press, which was very big back then, someone had read that somewhere the Welsh coal miners or some some miners somewhere had bred a species of small pony that was okay going down into the dark. Well, they ran with that. Oh, my God. Well, the dwarves live in the dark. Undoubtedly, they have ponies. They bred, oh, dwarven ponies. And they sprang out of the forehead of everybody's imagination. And they overran the D&D &D worlds. And so I made the belay eat them. Now, here's a second one that I'm not sure if you're trying to pull my leg or you maybe I was unclear. But again, it's never a good idea to pull or think you're pulling the curmudgeon's leg. If you'll notice, I'm wearing my curmudgeon shirt. Well, I guess I got to back up so you can see it. But I am wearing my curmudgeon shirt. So thought it only appropriate. Here's the response. Thieves can't, and can't spelling C-A-N apostrophe T. Indeed, they can't do much reliable until they gain a few levels. Well, yes, but that was not what I was referring to. And if you'd read several of the books on Appendix N, you'd know that the thieves can't, C-A-N-T, has a historical basis to it. Look it up. Don't try to pull my leg. Um, okay, Tim, have you ever played an early 90s board game called Supremacy? When you mentioned the game Nuclear War, it made me think of it as a similarly themed with nukes and world domination. Well, yes and no, and I believe it's earlier than the 90s. I believe Supremacy's been around at least a couple, pardon me, a couple, three different iterations. Burnings, ooh, pardon me. Drinking an energy drink. Um, and Supremacy is, is, a, is a much much different game, much more detailed. And Nuclear War is a very dark, very uh, nihilistic almost game because there's a result... Because every time you drop a, a warhead on somebody, you roll, well, it used to be, a, you had to spin a spinner, but a lot of those spinners wore out. So a friend of mine took a micrometer and measured the spinner on one of the games and converted it to a 20-sided uh, uh, percentage roll. In any event, you, you, you had a further thing, and there was one that was so pessimistic that it uh, set off a nuclear chain reaction and destroyed the universe. So, and it came out in 64. 
So in the height of the Cold War, so it was kind of like laughing at the big sword of Damocles that hung over all our heads back then. Um, the, the people in 64 remembered the duck and cover drills that we participated in as children back in the 50s and early 60s. And, of course, we now know they were totally and completely useless, but it gave us a sense of, uh, a sense of being able to do something. Um, and as I, I saw it, um, supremacy was more about, um, more about strategic maneuvering than it was actual bomb dropping. Now, I admit, I've not played it. I've watched it being played several times over the years. Just stopped by and watched a couple of turns. So I, I, I admit fully that I do not have a complete mastery of the rules and s turn sequence, etc. cetera. Uh, but nuclear war is so pessimistic. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, all right. Uh, I recently had a great deal of fun running the Tomb of Horrors for my friends. Oh, by the way, I know I read these really fast, and the ones that are badly spelled and punctuated, I stumble over. But the only way I can use my Tim voice is when I know what I'm going to be saying in advance. So, um, but even before the first session, my girlfriend became fixated on the idea of buying a host of chickens to run ahead of the party to set off any potential traps. Tragically, the group decided that the money spent purchasing and transporting 100 chickens several miles to the swamp the tomb was located in would be better spent elsewhere. And the idea and my research into the purchase of old chicken population of an average medieval town went to waste. My question is, and I gotta admit, anybody that tried to figure out how many chickens could possibly be on sale in a medieval town of a certain size. That's dedication to dungeon mastering. That's capital D, capital M in gold outlined letters. Um, my question is, what is the most absurd dungeoneering area you've been attempted, you've seen attempted or even suggested? Also, incidentally, how could you handle the poultry report approach at your table? I was looking forward to describing someone teleported into a pitch black Forsaken prison filled to the brim with maddening clucking. Um, <laughs> well, chickens stink. Chickeners are noisy. So not only do you hope that their little tiny bodies set off traps that are probably weighted for, you know, larger creatures because anybody that would put a hair trigger trap first time a rabbit bounded down the corridor. Uh, lost, trying to find its way out, it would set off the traps. And they stink and they make noise, so there's no surprise, forget it. But it, <laughs> it shows a good penchant for thinking outside the box. Now, I once was running a game at a con, and it was an adventure, not, not the Wheel of Blame, and for some reason, we had extra time, and so I got real generous, and I said, okay, everybody can pick a magic item, um, commensurate with something you might have found at the level, and I, I'd given them some uh, pretense. And so um, one guy picked a uh, speak with animals, ring. And yeah, that's a relatively, and so I didn't think anything about it. Sure, go ahead. And... Uh, <laughs> He, at my, at my table, I always tell him, okay, if you bring anything odd or unusual, um, write it down on your paper now so that later on you say you're doing this, you, yeah, you brought it with you. And if it's really unusual, run it by me first. Well, the guy simply told me he was bringing along a bag of 20 mice. I said, okay. And damned if he didn't use those mice to great effect speaking to them Okay, Jerry, run around the corner and tell me what you see when you come back. And, <laughs> you know, granted, I didn't give him, you know, full sentences and, and polished grammar, but as far as what a mouse would see, ooh, big room, scary, you know, whatever. That damn bag of mice uh, 
thwarted me. Um, I've seen people take in bags of marbles and they make, uh, you, there's a lot of things you can do with a handful of marbles besides the obvious slip them under their feet. You can throw them, um, you can p pitch them into holes to listen when they fall because, you know, who's going to say you bring a bag of rocks into the dungeon crawl unless you've written it down that you have a bag of pebbles. And then I'm okay with that. Um, you know, I, the, I, I think, I think anytime the players are willing to think outside the box for this, run with it for a little while until it becomes unworkable. The chickens would become unworkable right away because if you ever tried to herd a hundred chickens, forget it. If, if you took them down into the corridor and well, we'll, we'll give you two entrance, great, nice, lovely, you know, 15 foot wide and, and you know, double doors that open in and you took all those chicken coops and you put them up next to the doors and open them and let them, those, <laughs> yeah, oh God, that would be funny. Oh Lord, sounds like something out of Mighty Python. You'd have chickens flying everywhere. Um. Okay, then there were some there were some interesting replies this time. Um, a reply was I heard heard the same thing happening, only it was a herd of sheep. So what the DM told the players is the sheep are way too scared to enter. Brilliant. That's not out of character. Everybody knows that without a dog, you don't herd sheep anywhere they don't want to go. And without a ring of mammal control or something like that, the sheep aren't going to get... Brilliant idea. Um, somebody thought of a herd of sheep. Wonderful. Okay, and another reply. It's probably not too uncommon... Uh, a not too uncommon story once you see in a book the price of animals compared to the amount of money adventurers end up carrying around. The mind, the mind naturally turns to tactical zoology. <laughs> I like that. I'd write an article on that if I was still doing that. I, for one, once purchased a sack of vipers to cover my escape for a bank heist in a Pathfinder game after, after discovering they were less than a gold piece each. The heist didn't go to plan, and I completely forgot about them. The DM later reminded me when I discovered a bag of long-dead snakes at the bottom of my traveling pack. The traveling trunk. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> Maybe you didn't smell them. Um, to consider the possibility of fear, by the way, there was a whole plan with a filter and cages to force the chickens into the dungeon. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is a response to the other one. Um, she did consider the possibility of fear, by the way. There was a whole plan with a filter and cages to force the chickens into the dungeon and prevent their escape. By God, I, I got to hand it to a player that goes to that kind of detail, and I let them try it. And any time your players want to think outside the box like this, and they want to try it, you don't have to be arbitrary. You don't have to be capricious. All you have to do is figure out what the natural behavior of those things would be. Chickens run like, blah, you know, they scatter like crazy. Um, sheep don't go where they want to go. Um, if you got a nice block of, of aged gorgonzola and a bag of mice, and you offer a piece every time one of them goes runs an errand, and somehow you know the names of all the mice so that they all get a turn, uh, <laughs> go for it. I, I love it. Um, okay, now here's another one. I think the idea of sending animals into the tomb originally came from the story of how one of Gary Gygax's players sent orc henchmen to venture inside and set off any traps or monsters lurking inside. Very possible. Very possible. I know that a recurring theme over the many years that Jolly Blackburn has been doing Nights at the Dinner Table. <laughs> they, they, they can't anymore because the word's out, but the, constantly, constantly, we're sending uh, henchmen and, and pack bearers and whatever ahead and uh, not caring when they got skewered 
by the uh, traps that they had just set off. I'm uh, putting, changing the charger. I just saw that it was over, so I'm pulling the charger out. There we go. Um, sorry for that. Like those cannons. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure those guys tried that, did it. I'm sure. Um, just as I'm sure that just about every group that thinks outside the box has tried something similar to that. Uh, again, if you're if you're going to you know, classic movie we all love for robbing tombs, Indiana Jones. And when he steals the idol, he's got a bag of sand so he doesn't set off the counterbalance. Well, that was the plan. Um, all those traps and everything had been in there for how long and not been set? Okay, if you want to stretch it a little, I mean, this is a fantasy or a you know, high adventure story. Um, they were set to go off at above a certain weight. Because otherwise, wandering jungle animals would have triggered them all long before Indy got there. And the arrow, I believe it was an arrow trap with skewered people, where they were people. Anyway. Uh, I heard, I had heard, okay, another comment. I had heard of that story when I was preparing to run it. However, <laughs> however my girlfriend definitely hadn't, as this as despite hiring a guy to watch their gear car caravan outside the tomb, they never put two and two together and thought to hire a group of creatures more competent than chickens. <laughs> um, I think a bag of a, a bag of uh, tame weasels, or you know, stoats or, or small sinuous creatures like that that could handle you know the occasional ordinary rat uh, would be fun to have because. They could do all kinds of things if you had to speak with, you know, could speak with them. Um, okay, I noticed this was in the Dungeon Master Guide, uh, first edition's appendix and Zelazny, Roger, Jack of Shadows, Amber series at all. And was wondering if you're familiar with Roger Zelazny's work. Yes, I was much more familiar then than I am now because it's been so long since I've gone back and read any of it, because, my God, there's so much good new stuff coming out. Who can keep up? Um, and if so, what what do you think of him and his work? How does it apply to your game? Well, I don't know that there's any one thing out of one of his stories that I, I absorbed into my game. Gary and I spent a lot of time hashing out Appendix N. And one of the premises of uh, belonging to the appendix, or one of the qualifications was, did it have um, liftable, we didn't steal, we lifted, ideas that could be applied to uh, or woven into a campaign. And there were a lot of concepts in there that Gary liked, and they formed, um, in one way or another, his approach to writing of the game. I just read them because they were good stories. Maybe I picked something out of there and didn't think about it because um, most of those I read before we compiled Appendix N. And we compiled Appendix N in 76, 77. And um, my God, how many years ago was that? 45 years ago. Longer than that, 21. Ooh, 46. Anyway, a uh, long time ago. So yeah, it probably it, it had an effect, just like all the other books I read back then had an effect. And because Gary and I had read so many, both of us had read so many of the books, it those effects sometimes uh, hit both of us in different ways and sometimes the same way. Okay, next comment, or next topic. Games with atypical mounts. Dragonlance in the 80s. Let's chase dragons as low-level characters and get killed by one. At least Buck Rogers had a gun. <laughs> yeah, well, um, atypical mounts are, um, well, I have, a, I have an original 
piece of artwork by Bill Hannon, who did some of my very early cover work. And on it, um, it gave me an idea of a race of um, lizards, sentient lizards, whose brains have been not altered uh, surgically, but the, uh, there's a bit placed in their mouth that dulls their senses, and they're trained from an early age to be beasts of burden. And the adventure I'm going to write is how they uh, find, you know, find out and figure out that they're no longer... Anyway, um, the idea of writing different things, um, these are like, you know, really big, um, well, not velociraptors, but along along the lines of a, of, a, of a plant eater of that size, but of course faster. Anyway, um, oh, let's see, there was something else. Um, anyway, different mounts. I allowed anybody to try and train anything that they hatched out or, or got as a very small you know, infant or baby or whatever and could imprint on it or at least learn to train it. Why not? Why not? Um, ride a tiger. If, if, you know, there's no reason you, that you couldn't allow that in your campaign. Go to Swami Bill's tiger riding school. Seriously. Why not? Now, Wild animals might not take too carefully to that, but uh, or too kindly to it. Um, other than that, you know, riding a boule, I don't think so. Though I have a story idea calculating how the boule came to be, and um, this this uh, breeder geneticist dude. Actually, there's five subspecies of uh, different colors that all have different abilities, but they're they're extremely rare, and maybe never got off the island that they were bred on, or maybe they're there like Jurassic Park. But please know that I had the idea before I saw the movie Jurassic Park. Um, okay, getting dry. This is a long one. Got to read it. But it's interesting, and I like interesting ideas. I like people, you know, I, li I like people thinking outside the box. Hate to bring up level drain again. Don't don't hate it. It's a big topic, and it's you know it, it is scary. But I wanted to share my alternative nerf, um, alternative slash nerf slash reworking that I use. Instead of directly reducing levels, undead inflict levels of innervation on their in victims when they hit in the league. A persistent negative status. I'm like, I was liking this already, reading this, because it goes along and along with the thoughts so that I have with it. That the persistent negative status that the, that first takes away prepared spells and combat ability, though only for a day, but will persist indefinitely, slightly reducing the victim's hit points and endurance, and more importantly, will cause instant death should the level of enervation ever exceed a character's level. One naturally recovers from one level of enervation whenever you gain a level, but other than that, the only way to be rid of it is to have an expensive ritual conducted at a major temple to restore your life force. In addition to the immediate and persistent effects of enervation on the victims, the inflicting, the inflicting undead recovers 1d6 hit points whenever they drain someone, so fighting undead is, is often a nasty war of attrition that grows increasingly hopeless the longer it drains on. There's, that, there's, a, there's a phrase every DM loves, increasingly hopeless. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. As I've seen, weren't there video games when they touched you, they got energy, and you lost it? And yeah, I like the idea, though. If that's the way you play it in your world, who am I to say no? 
it's a little rough, but fine, there should be. A, you know, great reward should have great risk. Good for good thinking. Okay. Coffee. New new comment. Coffee. Strong black coffee is my go juice. I agree on the mental agility thing. I think keeping one's mind sharp is important, as do I. I don't like coffee. The only warm drinks that I like are broth, hot chocolate. Though I did, when I, I did consume a lot of coffee, if you could call it that, uh, when I was um, um, deployed on the Ranger and we were off the coast of Korea in the winter for uh, doing our UN uh, duty up there for like three weeks. And uh, it was so cold that they weren't allowing anybody topside and being in a big metal boat, <laughs> pretty soon the whole boat was cold. And um, that is just about the time that Maxim Instant Coffee came out. And it was really hyped up, strong stuff. And somebody had sent a friend a big jar of it. You know, big, big jar. Oh yeah, over here, there. <laughs> big jar. And um, we would uh, do it double strength, shave in, dark chocolate that we picked up in Hong Kong and make this sludgy stuff and drink it just to stay awake and, and to warm up. But I've never, yeah, that was a, a exigency. And uh, that didn't, didn't, don't like dark, yeah, but I like energy drinks. And I, I have a fondness for Mountain Dew. I would do every morning, take my pills and eat my piece of peanut butter toast. And that's my coffee. My wife drinks a big old mug of coffee. I drink a Mountain Dew. It seemed to me the crossword puzzle makers would do well using funny RPG jargon words. There's a glossary website for that jargon. That sounds like a nice little side business. And on the fringe of RPG conventions, Imagine some diehard anarcho-capitalist flying a sign like a panhandler, peddling RPG writer content provider. We'll trade RPG crossword puzzles for Gary Con tickets. <laughs> well, as I've said many times before, I do a couple of crosswords every morning, and um, one of the new, a couple of the new favorite words are orc and ant. You know, crossword puzzles love, writers just love those little odd three-letter words um, to fill in uh, places on, on the uh, uh, grid. And um, there's, you know, there's been other references to Tolkien. There's been references to D&D. &D, and um, I don't know that, I guess you could do a, a puzzle completely on role-playing gaming, but it would be such a nitpicky trivia thing or else so childishly easy, I don't know. But uh, no, I don't see anybody offering them for tickets, so. Okay, like my, okay, here we go. Get ready for the fight. <laughs> First comment, I like your approach to clerics. The immediate rebuttal. Give clerics too much freedom to choose the right spell for the occasion. Scrolls for that purpose in having a backup spell you don't normally memorize when you need it in a pinch. Even a potion of sweet water fills up the spell slot for neutralized poison. Not telling you how to run your show, but letting a cleric cast a fourth level spell for a third or lesser spell is basically a spell point system. Part of the challenge and reward in playing a spellcaster is picking the right combination of spells for an unknown encounter. It's not fair to the wizard either if suddenly your cleric has four silent spells with three to spell magics out of convenience. Well, my God really wants me to be a pain in this, this illusionist arse, so I'll turn in these two fourth-level spells for another silence and dispel magic," said the holy man. "That'll teach him to put a few, put a put a few in the offering plate, or better yet, suddenly the evil cleric casts eight consecutive hold persons upon your party from high atop his altar of vulnerability. Let's see those saves, boys and girls." I think you're taking really extreme examples. You can take any rule and find an extreme way to abuse it. As a DM, it's your job to see that it doesn't get abused. 
You can make up any reason you like. It's your world. If you know that you have a character who does this kind of stuff, well, it's time for him to run into somewhere that it doesn't necessarily help. It's not spell points. It's prayer slots versus spell slots. I'm uneasy with the idea of clerics casting spells, spells in my world, in my mindset, are magical conjurations, evocations, whatever. Clerics pray. That's what they do. They pray. They don't cast a spell. In my world. Your world? Fine. Do it. But as a DM, don't let this silly... No. Don't let it happen. After the second time they throw a spell and, and, and the, the, the victim, the target, makes a saving throw, that's it. Can't hurt him anymore. Now what are you going to do with those other two spells? You know, the, 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 the target has figured it out. You know, what you're doing so well, he's crafted a shield that absolutely blocks you and negates your effect. Easy peasy. Easy. You know, and you, you, this, this question almost makes it sound like it's adversarial. And, um, so what if you're fighting a bad guy? Um, a DM that gives the big bad guy a huge slew of some kind of spells like that, eight whole persons, is, <coughs> excuse me, in my opinion, not being fair to the players. That's an extreme. If you don't want the players being extreme, you as a DM can't be extreme. You shouldn't be extreme like that on either side. Now, if a wizard is has enough spell slots and he wants to carry nothing but fireballs and lightning bolts and at those levels, that's his choice entirely. It's his choice entirely. If he wants to memorize fireball three times, okay. That's his choice. Nothing I, as a DM, forced him into doing. All right, level drain and balance of power between player characters. The problem I have with playing level drain characters is not that I fear it happening to the character, but that it creates a power imbalance with other players. Oh. Oh. So, we continually, especially in the early days, we continually had a mixed party in terms of levels. Fifth levels playing with second levels. Later on, six levels playing with third levels, fourth levels. Guys joined, guys left. We were in college, remember? So people, and we were on a quarter system. So we, you know, often had a new player or two every quarter. So what? Who says everybody has to be the same? Now, I've got to put my specs on to read this because I didn't notice this, but the printer printed it out in 11 point. Even before the cataracts, which I've since had removed, I didn't read 11 point that well. When adventures of different levels are in the same party, low-level characters advance faster than high-level characters, as long as the low-level characters survive. Great point. That imbalance doesn't tend to last very long. The 5th level, 6th level, 8th level, pick a level, guy, needs more points to get to the next level. And as I guy, remember, I use it in the generic pre-woke term sense. Jesus, now I derailed myself. <laughs> okay, yes. Lower level guys need fewer points to get to the next level while the seventh level guy is getting 150,000 points to go, I'm, I'm picking up arbitrary numbers, go to the next level, the fourth level guy in that same 150 points might go up two and a half levels. Now it slows down as you go higher, as it should. Um, 
Okay, if you ensure your D&D group helps each other, that is, higher level characters on the front line, instead of merely competing with each other, then lower characters will eventually catch up most or all lost levels. When adventures at different levels are in the same party, low level characters advance faster than higher, as long as the low levels, okay, you know, oh, this guy printed this twice, okay. Oh no, my printer did. Okay. Um, yeah, but isn't it, it the, well, point well made, even though I printed it badly. Um, the party, it, it's supposed to be about us, not me, me, me. And it's been my experience that when you find yourself in a group with a me, me, me player, um, they tend to become unpleasant. Um, after a while, me, 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 to the detriment of everybody else. And unless they're bringing donuts and pastries to every game, still warm from the bakery, <laughs> why are you tolerating it? Why indeed? Why are you tolerating it? Okay, well, that's all the prepared stuff. Um, like I said, I'm going to see about putting in a new mic and or not a new mic a new camera and see if that doesn't improve which is not going to make me probably going to make me look worse but that's okay um let's see what's coming game holes coming um black seas good game um let's see oh i found i found another one um looks like it might be fun jungle joust it's called Looks interesting, silly, but interesting, and uh, plays out, it says, in 45 minutes. So, um, lo looks interesting. Um, what else? Guess that's all for now. And, uh, you know, I'm still wearing a mask when I go indoors when I'm out. I would encourage all of you to do the same. This Delta variant is weird, and um, I don't want to be the person that, oh, I don't get it, it mutates into the Echo variant. You wouldn't either, so I know it sucks, but it's better than uh, dying. So take care of yourself and your loved ones. Keep gaming, and uh, Dodada go be. Oh, hello. I'm still figuring out when this thing starts. <clears throat> Welcome to my cellar. He's the curmudgeon who wrote about the dungeons. Now he's the feller. Live from the cellar, talks about D&D and old school RPGs, still quite a feller, a curmudgeon in the cellar. Last man around when the race went down, calling Gary in that Lake Geneva town. Hey Gary, it's an awful mess, let me edit, we'll have success. D&D and Dragon Magazine. The curmudgeon who wrote about the dungeons Now he's the feller, live from the cellar Talks about D&D and old school RPGs But still quite the feller, the curmudgeon in the cellar Magic missile, it's a mortar shell Make it hit in the first level spell Brought psionics to the game to attack that wizard's brain DSR and fantasy, collection of micro armory Tight with tramp under a tree, high as could be. He's the curmudgeon who wrote about the dungeons. Now he's the feller, live from the cellar. Talks about D&D and old school RPGs, but he's still quite the feller, the curmudgeon in the cellar. Still quite the feller, the curmudgeon in the cellar. Curmudgeon.